I'm Dr. Steve and I'm starting a new series called Stranger Than Fiction looking at true crime including murder, kidnapping, disappearances and other ominous occurrences. I live in South Wales so I thought I'd start by looking at one of the most infamous unsolved crimes in Welsh history the tragic murder of 12 year old Muriel Drinkwater in Pentlegair in 1946. John and Margaret Drinkwater ran Tile D Farm on the outskirts of Pentlegair. They helped the local community combat rationing by selling produce like eggs and butter directly to local people, so the family were well integrated locally. They had four daughters, the youngest of whom was 12-year-old Muriel. Muriel attended the Gowerton Grammar School. Muriel was a happy girl who attended Sunday school and girl guides and had a habit of singing everywhere she went. In fact, she would do this so much that she acquired the nickname of the Little Nightingale. Unfortunately, after the 27th of June 1946, the Nightingale would sing no more. Muriel was dropped off by her usual school bus from Gowerton Grammar School at around 4.20pm. She lived around a mile from the bus stop, along a woodside path that curved into and around the trees, until it reached the farm. A regular walk for Muriel, that normally took about 20 minutes, and unsurprisingly, as she started her walk on the 27th of June, she began singing and walking down the path. Parts of the path were visible from the farm, and knowing Muriel's routine, her mother Margaret waved to Muriel some 400 yards down the path before it curved back into the woods, heading towards the farm. Muriel waved back, but this would be the last time that Margaret would see her daughter alive. Hubert Hoyles, a 13-year-old boy who had attended the same primary school as Muriel, but now attended a different grammar school, had been to the farm to buy eggs and he passed Muriel on the path as he headed back to the village. They exchanged greetings as they knew each other. Hoyles was the last person known to see Muriel alive as she never made it home. When Muriel failed to return home having been so near, Margaret Drinkwater went to the village to raise the alarm and a search party of police and local men began combing the woods in torrential rain to try and find the young girl. They came up empty that day, but around 10.30 the next morning, PC David Lloyd George, alerted by bright colours in a nearby Japanese larch plantation, found the body of the little nightingale. She had suffered blunt force trauma to the skull, been raped and shot twice in the chest. The murder weapon, a World War I Colt 45, the grip adjusted by the addition of perspex, was found near the murder scene the next day. The murder weapon, the Colt 45, was an American Army issue. But given that American soldiers had been stationed at Pentlegare during the then recent Second World War, the weapon was not the lead it might have been, since it could easily have been owned and perhaps sold by one of the locally based soldiers at the end of the war. Hubert Hoyles, the last person to see Muriel, came under scrutiny early. He was a regular visitor to the farm and mentioned a, pre a prior journey to the farm in the weeks before Muriel was killed, when he was surprised by a man stepping from the bushes near where Muriel was killed. The man, thought to be in his thirties, was wearing a brown jacket and trousers, 
and according to Hoyles had thick fluffy hair and a local accent. Nothing came from this potential lead, nor indeed from the suspicion of Hoyles himself. The police immediately established an, an extensive investigation that ultimately involved them visiting homes and locations of interest over a wide area. It led to over 20,000 men being interviewed across the wide search area. The Little Red Riding Hood, Hood murder, as it became known for Muriel's path through the woods, generated huge national interest, but sadly no leads, and soon the case grew cold. Autopsy revealed Muriel had been struck on the skull and shot twice in the chest. Cigarette stubs and sweet wrappers found at the murder site suggested that someone had waited there. The murder weapon were World War I Army issue Colt 45 with a modernised perspex grip. Dried semen stain was found and marked in crayon on Muriel's blue coat. Hubert Hoyles As the last person to see Muriel, Hoyles was under the microscope of suspicion from the start. He would likely have known her routine and could have planned his farm visit accordingly. Where he may have obtained the gun is unknown, as is whether he smoked and could have been the source of the cigarette butts at the murder site. He was, of course, a child himself, but in the absence of other viable suspects he was scrutinised heavily and he was considered a person of interest for the decades following the murder. Harold Jones, one of the most notorious killers in Welsh history, Jones was convicted of killing two girls in Abertillery in 1921 when he was just 15. He was released from prison in 1941, so would have been free. Harold Jones One of the most notorious killers in Welsh history, Jones was convicted of killing two girls in Abertillery in 1921 when he was just 15. He was released from prison in 1941, so would have been free at the time of Muriel's murder. Neil Milkins is a Welsh author who studied the life of Harold Jones and proposed Jones as a viable suspect. It may be that his history and notoriety was more of a factor in his becoming a suspect than any proximity to Pentlager. However, his history as a murderer at the age of just 15 does add credence to the consideration of 13-year-old Hoyles as a suspect. The Fluffy-Haired Man The only other suspect of note was the man seen by Hoyles loitering at the murder site in the weeks before the murder. Considered local due to Hoyles recognising a local accent. The fact that Hoyles did not know the man suggests that while local he was unlikely to have been from the Pentlager village or Hoyles would likely have recognised him. No further mention is made of this man and it seems the likely that the description was too vague to have been much use to police. It could also have been a complete red herring devised by Hoyles to deflect suspicion from himself. An American serviceman. While never specifically mentioned in any of my research, the fact that the murder weapon was American Army issue must hint at the possibility of an American serviceman as the murderer in this case. While the gun could just as easily have been sold by an American serviceman, it is probably worth considering as a possibility a hypothesis to be tested in the absence of other suspects.
In 2003, after success using DNA evidence in cold cases, the case was looked at again in the hope of finding DNA on the murder weapon, but the gun had seemingly been handled by too many people to provide a clear sample. At this time Muriel's clothes that had been analysed and stored at the time of the murder were unable to be located and presumed lost. In 2008, DCI Paul Bethel found the clothes in police storage. By this time, the semen stain on the coat was no longer visible, but thankfully the crayon used to mark around it was still visible. The coat was sent to Dr. Colin Dark, and in a painstaking process of repeated attempts over the course of three years, he successfully extracted enough DNA to create a profile. This is believed to be the oldest forensic sample ever successfully extracted. The profile generated was a YSTR profile generated from the male specific Y chromosome. While no match was found from the UK National DNA Database, the profile was used to rule out both Harold Jones and Hubert Hiles as suspects. It would seem that the best hope for a resolution to the case rests with familial DNA analysis as worked with Joseph D'Angelo, the Golden State Killer. But given that the profile is Y chromosome specific, will require an all male lineage that includes the murderer. Trust me, I'm a geneticist. Also, I've seen no evidence that the profile has been checked against the US DNA databases. And given the American link with the murder weapon, this should be strongly considered. I, for one, hope that Muriel can one day get justice. In 2010, the case was closed off to public access at the request of Scotland Yard. This means the drink water files cannot be accessed by freedom of information requests. I understand the police wanting to protect ongoing investigations, but this is particularly strange for a case that is so old. Rather than end on such a sombre note, I thought I'd leave you with a thought that is perhaps less bleak and will hopefully bring you back from the dark place that I have just taken you to. The game of golf is played and enjoyed by millions of people who invest time, money and energy into improving at a game that itself generates millions in revenue. It is one of the most popular hobbies and countless people take enjoyment from the game. Isn't it strange then that the aim of golf is to play less golf? Goodbye.